Good morning, Brew Daily Show. I'm Neil Fryman. And I'm Toby Howell. Today, convicted fraudster Sam Bankman Freed learned just how long he'll spend in prison. Then Ice Cube offered Caitlin Clark $5 million to play in his 3v3 basketball league. It's Friday, March 29th. Let's ride. Today, March 29th, marks one year since Evan Gershkovich, a 32-year-old American Wall Street Journal reporter, was unjustly detained in Russia on accusations of espionage, charges that the paper and the U.S. government say are bogus. Russia's foreign ministry has said it would be open to a prisoner swap, but not until a verdict is reached in his trial, which has not been scheduled yet, and who knows when that will happen. His detention has been extended for five times now, with the latest extension coming last week. People across the media industry are calling on leaders to get Evan home as quickly as possible, saying doing journalism is not a crime. Yeah, his friends and family have been keeching, keeping in touch with him. Evan says that they're keeping him up to date on his favorite Premier League team. He's a big Arsenal fan, which is having a fantastic season, which might help bolster his spirits a little bit. They're also chatting with him about developments in AI because he said that he wants to be current when he comes back to the States. His sister even asked him if she could see Dune too, because she felt bad that she would go to see it while he currently can't. But still, obviously it's very hard to be in this almost fake reality where you don't know when or if you're going to be coming home soon, but hopefully that homecoming trip is sooner rather than later. Before you hear today's news, we have a quick word from our friends over at factor. Neil, We've made it to the end of our Factor journey. The flavors were magical, the Factor truck sightings were frequent, and nary a dish was cleaned along the way. It may be the end of our Factor sponsorship, but I will always remember the chicken and cauliflower rice I ate along the way. I hope you had as much fun and got as much nourishment out of Factor as we did this past month. But the beautiful thing is your Factor journey doesn't have to end here. Yeah, why are we being all Debbie Downer about it? You can keep on eating chef-prepared, dietitian approved and fresh, never-frozen meals by doing what, Neil? By heading to factormeals.com slash morningbrew50, then using code morningbrew50 to get 50% off. One last time, that's factormeals.com slash morningbrew50, then use code morningbrew50 to snag that tasty 50% discount. 25 years. That's how long FTX founder Sam Bakeman fried was sentenced to prison yesterday for perpetrating one of the biggest financial frauds in U.S. history. In handing down the sentence, Judge Lewis Kaplan said he considered the brazenness of SBF's actions, his lack of remorse, and the possibility he would commit crimes going forward. There is a risk that this man will be in a position to do something very bad in the future, and it's not a trivial risk at all, Kaplan declared. In the courtroom, SBF said he was sorry about what happened at every stage. At the end of the day, he said, I failed everyone I cared about. This sentencing is the final chapter in what was one of the most rapid rise and falls in finance history. SBF founded the crypto exchange FTX in 2019, and not long after, he became one of the youngest billionaires on the planet and was hobnobbing with the world's elite, Tom Brady, Bill Clinton, Larry David. But everything fell apart, and they fell apart quickly. When it was found, he had stolen $8 billion in customer funds to fund a lavish lifestyle and risky investments at a separate hedge fund. Toby, what's your takeaway from this SBF saga? I'm kind of going to steal one of your takes, Neil, because it is just truly remarkable how symmetrical SBF's rise and fall was. Just as fast as he bursts onto the scene in Rose to Promise, it felt like he matched that exact same pace on the way down. In math terms, you told me yesterday, offhandedly you said it looks kind of like a y equals negative 10x squared graph which i can confirm tastes this very steep parabola up and down so my takeaway is the one that you kind of uttered in my ear yesterday but i think this time period this this sentencing that the judge passed down was kind of where people expected sbf's team wanted just six and a half years while the prosecutors wanted as high as 40 to 50 years if he serves this full sentence he'll get out when he's 57 years old but potentially he will be able to get out earlier uh, on good service. So I think that it, it came in right around the area where people were expecting. Yeah, that. let's talk about um, SPF sentence as it relates to other high profile white collar criminals. 
the judge did not think that he was he his the, his crimes were as bad as Bernie Madoff, who ran that Ponzi scheme that unraveled during the 2008 financial crisis. Madoff received a 150-year sentence in 2009, but he died 12 years later. And then the other one that comes to mind is Elizabeth Holmes, uh, who defrauded investors through her Theranos, a biotech startup. She was sentenced to 11 years and three months back in 2022. So the best comp here might actually be Enron CEO Jeffrey Skilling, because he was sentenced to 24 years, though he ended up serving only 12. So that's a pretty good comp, 25 years to 24, SBF and Enron. <laughs> Not a great comp if you're SBF, no. yeah. One of the goals of SBF's team was to kind of paint the picture that he was not Bernie Madoff. That was a almost stated goal going in. They tried to say that he doesn't make decisions with mouse in, in his heart. He makes decisions with the math in his head. The math wasn't math in, in his head by the end of, of his journey, though. One big difference is that FTX depositors have been promised that they will be made whole. There is an asterisk to that made whole, though, because they'll get the value of their deposit crypto in dollars and it will be equivalent to their holdings as of November 2022. The issue is that in the interim period, crypto has absolutely gone on this massive bull run. Bitcoin hit an all-time high. So you're getting, you're losing out on all the potential gains that that money would have been uh, accruing, those gains that would have been accruing. And technically, you're being made whole, but it just doesn't feel like you're made whole because you missed out on all the, the gains. Yeah, this was just a huge black eye in the whole era of crypto, the Wild West. I think SBF didn't, wasn't really interested in crypto. He started a he was trading stocks and bonds and then went into crypto when he realized how much money you could be made and that maybe that's because the rules were so gray and i think it just represents this very sort of wild west no rules barred era of crypto that the industry is trying to move past and sbf sort of represented the, just the chaos and the frenzy around that time in the crypto industry absolutely and sbf has vowed to appeal his conviction but he did say after the sentencing's at the end of the day, my useful life is probably over now. So he knows where he currently is. We are now three days removed from the cargo ship ramming a major bridge in Baltimore, leading to its collapse and the deaths of six construction workers. But while the bridge went down in mere seconds, figuring out who is going to pay for the damage and who should be held liable is going to take a lot longer. There are so many companies and owners involved, not to mention obscure maritime laws that predate even the Titanic, forming this complex web that is almost as tangled as the bridge itself laying in the Baltimore Harbor. To start peeling back the layers, the ship is owned by a Singapore-based Singapore company that is insured by a member of an international insurance consortium that provides 90% of the marine liability coverage for ocean freight. These insurers pool together their liability claims to reduce the risk individual companies have to take on, kind of like agreeing to split the bill via Venmo before a dinner with friends. That consortium also buys an extensive reinsurance program, which further spreads out any potential losses. So even though this insurance bill will be massive, some analysts think it will be in the two to four billion dollar range. No one company is gonna go bankrupt. But that's just the tip of the iceberg here, Neil. Yeah, we got deep into marine insurance and marine losses yesterday. That three to four billion dollar range, we should say in terms of insurance claims, that is the single, that would be the largest single marine insurance loss ever. There was a cruise ship in Italy that capsized in 2012, and that led to $1.5 billion in losses. So if this bill comes out to $3 billion, which it is expected to, then it would be the largest single marine loss ever by a factor of two. Yeah, and I do want to dig into some of these. We keep referencing this obscure maritime law. Um, the ship's owner will be able to actually cap how much it is liable for in this case because there's a statute that dates back to 1851. It caps the, owner li the owner's liability at how much the vessel is worse after the crash, plus any earnings it collected from carrying freight on board. That law literally predates the Titanic and was passed to prevent shipping giants from sh uh, suffering these huge insurmountable losses from the inevitable disasters that happen on sea. It was literally to encourage sea exploration back in the day. So that law will come into play here and cap some of the liability that the Singaporean company will be on the hook for. And the Titanic uh, owners did invoke that law famously in 1912 after that ship went down. I think the good thing, the good news here, according to experts, is that both the ship and the bridge, the two huge structures that were involved in this 
collision were insured. Uh, so that is is kind of like two cars crashing uh, on on the road. But it's not like a natural disaster where if a hurricane comes into Florida, there's a lot of uninsured people and homes and things like that. So the fact that both of these structures are insured could spread out the risk and spread out the uh, sort of the damage claims, but it's still going to be a ton of money. One issue is that some businesses will be left out to dry. For instance, there's this Domino sugar refinery uh, right next to the bridge that uses the bridge all the time. It's going to suffer significant losses to their business and it won't really be able there's no recourse for them losing access to the harbor. So that is one person or one uh, aspect of this kind of big insurance pie that might get left out to dry. The businesses that are suffering from this this catastrophic loss. Yeah, I mean, so as all of this litigation get, gets through uh, in court with reference to the ship and the bridge, that is going to take possibly decades. But the most immediate concern is for the people who are working in conjunction with the port, which handled $80 billion of cargo there. The most pressing issue right now is the 2,400 members of the Maryland Longshoremen Union who are working at the Port of Baltimore. And that port is closed indefinitely because there's wreckage blocking the entrance to the port. They are they have no idea what they're going to do for, for jobs, so the government might need to go and step in and help them. Meanwhile, President Biden has pledged that the federal government is going to pay for the bridge's repair. But that uh, Congress is not in session now, but you have representatives already casting doubt on whether that will be able to pass. So we're going to see a lot of fights and litigation and a lot of wrangling in Congress over the next few weeks and years. OK, if you can believe it, the first quarter of 2024 ends today. Actually, on Wall Street, it ended yesterday because the markets are closed today for Good Friday. So cue up Little Wonders by Rob Thomas, because it's time to run through all the memories from Q1 on the stock market. Toby here has already started crying, and it has to be happy tears because stocks had an incredible quarter. The S&P ended more than 10 percent higher, good for its best Q1 gain in four years. The index has closed at a record 21 times so far this year. And it wasn't only stocks going up and to the right, everything from Bitcoin to Gold hit, hit record highs in the first quarter. Oil has also gained for three months straight. And I don't want to jinx it, but everything seems to be in a pretty good place right now. The economy is humming. Inflation has dropped close to normal levels. The Fed is on track to lower interest rates this year. And corporate profits hit a record in the final quarter of 2023, raking in $2.8 trillion. Toby, first of all, here's a Kleenex. No, you're emotional. Second of all, I want you to hand out some game balls from Q1. What are some stocks you want to highlight? I would like to hand out a game ball to pretty much everyone. I do want to start on the broad level uh, to begin with. The S&P is on track to end a second straight quarter with a return of more than 10%. That's the first time that's happened in over a decade. It's only happened seven times going back to 1945. Even the Dow showed signs of life. It's on pace to finish the quarter up more than 5%. Disney put the team on its back on the Dow and the blue chip index. 35% higher in the quarter. And then you got Caterpillars, uh, American Express, Merck, Travelers. They all are up over 20%. In total, 82 stocks in the S&P 500 hit new 52-week highs yesterday. So you're right. I have no more game balls left to give because I just tossed them out you left and right. I was very, uh, I was very, very generous, generous with my game balls. Well, I, let's talk about AI because AI had uh, had sort of driven the stock rally over the past year. The so-called magnificent seven stocks were propping up the stock market. I think in Q1, and the reason you gave out so many game balls is because the magnificent seven were not all that magnificent in Q1, and the stock market still did really well. I mean, there's kind of a bifurcation happening now among the magnificent seven, which are these massive tech giants. There's really Magnificent Two. And the Magnificent Two now are NVIDIA and Meta, which have ballooned recently thanks to their investments in AI. Then you have maybe the, the middling two, uh, which are Microsoft and Amazon. They've done OK. But there are a few companies that are not doing well, and that is Apple, which was down 11 percent last quarter, and then Tesla, which was the worst performing stock on the S&P 500, which was down 29 percent thanks to really sagging demand in China. So Tesla according to analysts, is in a really rough spot. And I don't know if it belongs in the Magnificent Seven because it doesn't have a lot of AI stuff going on anyway. It, it could turn around, though, because we are going to get first quarter production and delivery numbers on April 2nd, which is coming up next week. Just to put a bow on everything, consumer sentiment also jumped in March. It's at its best level in nearly three years. There's optimism about economic outlook, about the rate cuts. So you're right. Stocks and crypto have surged to record high. Meme stocks are, are back again. So 
there is just this feeling of buoyancy in the market right now. A lot of it is kind of propelled by the eventual rate cuts that we see on the horizon. So that's still the question mark looming, but it looks like we're going to see them um, based off comments that we've heard out of out of Jerome Powell. Up next, Biden threw a big old political fundraiser and Caitlin Clark got an offer she might not be able to refuse. President Biden got the gang back together last night to throw a fundraising party to end all fundraising parties, put together in part by Condé Nast's Anna Wintour. The shindig featured a conversation between the big three of Biden, Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama, moderated by Stephen Colbert. A smattering of other celebrities like Ben Platt, Leah Michelle, Lizzo, and Queen Latifah, along with 5,000 other guests crammed into the Radio City Music Hall in New York. Why is this particular event of note? Well, the Biden team confirmed that the party raised a staggering $25 million, which is likely the largest fundraising hall from a single event in American politics history, according to the Biden campaign. On the other side of the aisle, Trump is also looking to bolster his coffers as his legal troubles have bled his campaign dry. But it's a bit less of a pretty picture. As of March 1st, Trump's campaign only had $42 million in the bank, compared with Biden's $155 million, according to The Hill. Neil, this party is only going to help Biden extend his already significant fundraising lead heading into the election. And it's kind of interesting to note the contrasting fundraising strategies totally. at play here. Well, let's talk about how you raise $25 million from a single event, and that's by selling really expensive tickets. The tickets were priced from $225, so you could, could, could get in for basically a Knicks ticket. Or if you want to pay a half a million dollars, you could do that too and get more access to those three the three past Democratic presidents. A photo with all three of them cost you $100,000. A donation of $250,000 get you access to one reception last night. And then a half a mil gets you even into a more exclusive gathering. So there are these tiers uh, that were going on that helped Biden raise $25 million in over the span of three hours. Yeah, $25 million is huge because they threw, uh, Obama and Biden threw a joint fundraiser back in December. That raised $3 million. So this is exponential larger and yeah this one party is expected to bring in five million more dollars than trump raised during the entire month of february and we also mentioned that fundraising gap that already exists yeah on the trump side of things it it I said the contrasting fundraising strategy because Trump has been slinging these $60 God bless the USA Bibles on his true social platform. That is not actually a fundraising effort. He's not affiliated. The company is not affiliated with the Trump organization, but it is just going to show that here's how he is approaching it. It's a much more like grassroots like connection but with his audience. But he's getting a share of the profits. It's a classic licensing deal that right. Trump does uh, consistently, but he's aiming to do a $33 million fundraiser next week with a bunch of hedge funds billionaires. So we'll see if that can top the record that was set last night. Meanwhile, Trump has a billions of dollars locked up in True Social, with which went public this week and has shot up 60 percent uh, over the course of its time on the public market, which was just a few days. It's very unclear, as you mentioned a bunch of times on the show, how he will get access to that money because it is tied up in a bunch of stock. It's not really liquid right now. And he does have some massive bills to pay. He has that $175 million bond that he has to put up within 10 days, even though that was reduced from a lot more. So yeah, there are a lot of interesting fundraising things going on right now between the two presidential candidates. And obviously money is so important to build your campaign infrastructure to pay for ads and things like that as you gear up to try to win the White House. Moving on, Toby, I want you to put yourself in Caitlin Clark's shoes your basketball's biggest phenom, the all-time leading scorer in D1 history, the projected number one pick in the WNBA draft next year, and you're about to play a Sweet 16 game tomorrow against Colorado. But this week, you hear that the rapper Ice Cube has made you an offer to play in his 3v3 basketball league called the Big Three. And the salary? $5 million to play 10 games. That's far more than you're going to make in the WNBA, where rookies typically earn under $80,000 a year and play a lot more than 10 games. Just to be clear, this all actually happened this week. TMZ reported the $5 million offer to Caitlin Clark, and Ice Cube confirmed it on social media, calling the offer historic and Caitlin a generational athlete who could transform his league, which he started in 2017 and has never had a woman player. All right, Toby slash Caitlin. Clark, how you're responding to Ice Cube. Sorry, I'm still just marinating the fact of what it would feel like to be able to actually shoot and make three pointers. <laughs> That's never a feeling that I've had in my entire life. So I think that this is a very real offer. This is not a, I mean, it is a publicity stunt because there is publicity coming, but I do think Ice Cube 
very much meant this as a as a real offer. He said that he didn't even want it to go public. It accidentally leaked to TMZ. So, and the, another thing is is that Ice Cube pointed out the fact that two female coaches have actually won the league. There's a former college standout, Nancy Lieberman, won the Big Three championship in her first year. Lisa Leslie came in and won it as a coach in her second year. So, I don't think Ice Cube's just paying lip service to women's basketball. He genuinely believes that this is an opportunity to put it on a big stage, put Caitlin Clark against some men too, which. I mean, who wouldn't want to, yeah. to see that in this very unique format? It's a three on three basketball league, so it's not the, the typical five on five. So I would love to see this happen. Yeah. And and what Ice Cube was mentioning when he when he described this offer was that a lot of WNBA athletes have to play overseas because they don't make a ton of money relative. I mean, not even close relative to the men. The highest salary in the WNBA last year was just over two hundred thousand dollars, I think. So Caitlin Clark, who's made $3.5 million in NIL endorsements from her time in college. It's going to make a lot less in the WNBA uh, just playing basketball. So a lot of WNBA stars have to go overseas to places like Russia and Asia and Europe to uh, to make more money. And that is one reason why Brittany Griner was in Russia and was detained there for 10 months on drug charges. And they she was only, you know, gone back home due to a prisoner swap. So Ice Cube identified the fact that WNBA players have to play overseas and he doesn't want that to happen to I mean, obviously, Caitlin Clark, but other other women players as well. Right. Not to splash cold water on things, but there are definitely multiple scheduling conflicts yeah. because the seasons are going on at the same time. Also, the big three is reportedly not on great terms with the NBA, which also owns the WNBA. There is this DOJ investigation to see if the NBA violated antitrust law when it was dealing with the big three. So who knows if it's going to happen? The one thing that I do think could propel it to get in this deal across the finish line is that CBS broadcast both the big three and the WNBA. So it's in their best interest to get more eyeballs there. So that is something, a tailwind that could perhaps get this thing across the finish line. Meanwhile, Caitlin Clark tomorrow versus Colorado I'm could set in. up a potential rematch with LSU. I'm so pumped about that. Neil, if I am looking a little blurry eyed to you right now, it's because I stayed up till midnight last night waiting for Beyonce's new album to drop. And I have to say it, totally worth it. Cowboy Carter is based first album length foray into the country music world. And frankly, it slaps some hidden gems that we didn't know till release. The album features a cover of Dolly Parton's Jolene. It also features a cover of the Beatles classic Blackbird, which Paul McCartney originally wrote as a tribute to the Little Rock Nine, the first African-American students who enrolled in an Arkansas high school in 1957 to desegregate it. A who's who of country music stars pop up in various features, including Dolly Parton, Willie Nelson and Linda Martell. And more contemporary stars include Miley Cyrus and Post Malone. Unfortunately for us all, Taylor Swift does not appear on Cowboy Carter, despite rumors suggesting otherwise. Neil, country music, Beyonce, Cowboy Carter, it's all happening Oh, right man. Now. I mean, this is obviously going to be the soundtrack to a lot of people's weekends and maybe even the summer. I don't know. It's it's We're getting into April. But yeah, this is the second part of a three-part project that Beyonce released in uh, 2021 called The, the Renaissance. Oh, well, her first album was Renaissance. And this project aims to sort of pay tribute to the black roots of various musical genres. That first album, Renaissance, was went back to disco and house music. And then in this one country era, uh, Beyonce wants to sort of explore the black origins of country music. I find it very interesting how, how musicians right now are building mythologies around certain eras. Obviously, we've seen Taylor Swift do it with complete outfit changes and complete vibe changes on based on different eras of their career and the different genres they explore. I think Beyonce has done that so well in her marketing for this album and the various teases that she did leading up to it. I mean, everyone was watching her Grammy outfit, which where she wore a Western style garb. So, uh, th you know, the way that musicians are building their discography and going through various eras and building mythologies around that, I think is a very interesting transition or emerging trend in the music business. I, I couldn't agree more. And I just love this album in general too, because I do think uh, non-country stars dabbling in the country music gives it such a different feel and a different sound to it. So I really have enjoyed listening to, to it so far. One thing that I also loved is that Dolly Parton jumps in. She introduces uh, the track um, where they're covering Jolene by referencing that hussy with the good hair, which is itself a reference to Beyonce's 2016 uh, song, Sorry, where she called out Becky with the good hair. So you kind of have this cross genre, cross generation referencing the same themes here of like your 
significant other cheating on you. Um, so I just love that all of these, all of these different things are being mixed into the same pot and it comes out tasting very delicious. All right, we have to wrap it up there on that beautiful phrasing. <laughs> have a great weekend and a very happy Easter to everyone celebrating on Sunday. As always, please write in with any feedback to morningbrewdaily at morningbrew.com. Toby has a long plane ride ahead of him and he loves reading your emails. Let's roll the credits. Emily Milliron is our executive producer. Raymond Liu is our producer. Olivia Graham is our associate producer. Uchenawa Ogu is our technical director. Billy Menino is on audio. Hair and makeup is binging Cowboy Carter and does not want to be interrupted. Devin Emery is our chief content officer and our show is a production of Morning Brew. Great show today, Neil. I wish you well.